Hi there and welcome to church. My name is Angus Courtney. I'm the site pastor at St Oswald's Haberfield, which with St John's Ashfield and St Albans Fire Dock make up Christ Church in the West. And I'm here today with Ali Warren, our Director of Children's Ministry. If you're tuning in for the first time, we're so glad you're here. We hope that you find today encouraging and uplifting for your soul. You might like to leave a comment in the chat to let us know that you're with us. Or if you want to connect a little more formally and in a way that allows one of our pastoral team to contact you throughout the week and see if there's any way we can serve you, hit the connect with us button at the top of your screen, which will take you to an online form. And at the bottom of your screen, you'll see a live prayer button. If there's any way that we can be praying with you or for you today, we'd love to do that. Some of our pastoral staff team will be there to take your prayer requests and pray for you in real time. Um, and especially warm welcome if you've got kids with you today. If you click on the kids tab at the top of your screen, you'll be taken to a site where there's games, videos and activities prepared by the kids church team for you to do. So we'd love for you to check that out. We're in week two of a sermon series about Job at the moment. And last week we learnt about how God's grace is the only foundation for our lives that will withstand suffering and trials. And so we hope that as this series continues, that you're encouraged to lean into God's grace to get you through it. We're going to sing momentarily, but before that, we're going to read through this call to worship. So if you could join me in the words in bold, that would be great. Our hearts are confident, O Lord. Our, our hearts, hearts are confident. confident. We will sing and make music. We, we will, will awaken, awaken the, the dawn. dawn. We will give thanks to you, O Lord, among the peoples. We will sing praises to you among the nations. For your steadfast love is great above the heavens, and your faithfulness reaches to the clouds. Let's lift our voices in song to our great God. i mm-hmm. 
When the sea is calm and all is right When I feel your favor flood my life Even in the good I'll follow you Even in the good I'll follow you When the boat is tossed upon the waves When I wonder if you'll keep me safe Even in the storms I'll follow you Even in the storms I'll follow you Now when Job's three friends heard of all this evil that had come upon him, they came each from his own place, Eliphaz the Temanite, Bildad the Shuhite, and Zophar the Namathite. They made an appointment together to come to show him sympathy and comfort him. And when they saw him from a distance, they did not recognize him. And they raised their voices and wept. And they tore their robes and sprinkled dust on their heads toward heaven. And they sat with him on the ground seven days and seven nights. And no one spoke a word to him, for they saw that his suffering was very great. After this, Job opened his mouth and cursed the day of his birth. And Job said, 
let the day perish on which I was born, and the night that said a man is conceived, let that day be darkness. May God above not seek it, nor light shine upon it. Let gloom and deep darkness claim it. Let clouds dwell upon it. Let the blackness of the day terrify it. That night, let thick darkness seize it. Let it not rejoice among the days of the year. Let it not come into the number of the months. Behold, let that night be barren. Let no joyful cry enter it. Let those curse it who curse the day, who are ready to rouse up Leviathan. Let the stars of its dawn be dark. Let it hope for light, but have none. Nor see the eyelids of the morning because it did not shut the doors of my mother's womb, nor hide trouble from my eyes. Then Eliphaz the Temanite answered and said, If one ventures a word with you, will you be impatient? Yet who can keep from speaking? Behold, you have instructed many, and you have strengthened the weak hands. Your words have upheld him who is stumbling, and you have made firm the feeble knees. But now it has come to you, and you are impatient. It touches you and you are dismayed. Is not your fear of God your confidence and the integrity of your ways your hope? Remember, who that was innocent ever perished or where were the upright cut off? As I have seen, those who plough iniquity and sow trouble reap the same. By the breath of God they perish and by the blast of his anger they are consumed. Then Bildad the Shuhite answered and said, how long will you say these things, and the words of your mouth be a great wind? Does God pervert justice, or does the Almighty pervert the right? If your children have sinned against him, he has delivered them into the hand of their transgression. If you will seek God and plead with the Almighty for mercy, if you are pure and upright, surely then he will rouse himself for you and restore your rightful habitation. And though your beginning was small, your latter days will be very great. Then Zophar the Namathite answered and said, Should a multitude of words go unanswered, and a man full of talk be judged right? Should your babble silence men, and when you mock, shall no one shame you? For you say, My doctrine is pure, and I am clean in God's eyes. But oh, that God would speak, and open his lips to you, and that he would tell you the secrets of wisdom. For he is manifold in understanding. Know then that God exacts of you less than your guilt deserves. There is nothing more certain in your life and in the life of people around you and close to you than that you will suffer. We live in a world where death and disappointment and disease strike with monotonous regularity and we are more aware of that than ever. And we began last week learning from uh, that book of the Bible and perhaps of any piece of literature anywhere in the world that responds to suffering with the greatest depth and insight and wisdom, the book of Job. When suffering hits, it's almost instinctive to ask or, or perhaps to cry two sets of questions. The why questions and the how questions. Why? Why is this happening? And how can I get through it? As we started our journey uh, with Job last week, we looked a little at the why question. We saw a crucial thing, that you will not get an answer to the why question. Which means that if you can't cope with suffering without knowing why it's happening, then you won't cope with suffering. And what's more, there's a thing that not getting an answer to the why question is supposed to do for you. It is to deepen our trust in the living and true God of all goodness and grace specifically to trust God even with what not to tell us. And it's precisely that trust that means that suffering has the power to produce in us endurance and endurance will produce character and character will produce hope and hope will not disappoint us. So that's the first thing that Job has for us on the, the why question. It's very important. But perhaps it's mostly important before and after suffering actually hits. In the, in the middle of suffering, there's often a much more pressing question the how question. How do I handle this? How am I going to get through this? And the book of Job also has some profound and important things to say about the how question as well. One of the most important things we need to get through suffering is comfort. Comfort which gives us the strength to go on. It won't take away the shock 
and the pain, a bit like the way that the shock absorbers of your car don't take away all the bounce when you go over a bump. But what they do is absorb some of it for you in such a way that the bumps don't break the car apart. And being part of a community of care, having friends alongside us in the midst of the pain, friends who comfort us and give us strength is a crucial part of surviving suffering. There's more to it than friends, but there's not less to it. And we're going to see th three things about friends, what friends should do, what friends shouldn't do, and then what friends can't do. So first then, what friends should do. I mentioned last week that the book of Job was two prose bookends with a kind of an epic poetic poetry section in the middle. In chapter 2, we were introduced to Job's three friends, his mates. And from chapter 3 all the way through to chapter 31, we see Job and his friends talking and sharing and learning. And the fascinating thing is just how excruciatingly terrible the conversation is. The learning we do in chapter 2 is primarily positive. But the learning we do in the poetry section from chapter 3 onwards, at least with Job's friends, is primarily negative. Because it turns out, as Job puts it in chapter 16, verse 2, that miserable comforters are you all. They're not good comforters, strength givers. They're miserable comforters. And this is a bit of a surprise to us, since in chapter 2, the friends seem to get it just right. Verse 11. Now, when Job's three friends heard of all these troubles that had come upon him, each of them set out from his home. Eliphaz the Temanite, Bildad the Shuhite, and Zophar the Namathite. They met together to go and console and comfort him. And when they saw him from a distance, they did not recognize him. And they raised their voices and wept aloud. They tore their robes and threw dust in the air upon their heads. They sat with him on the ground seven days and seven nights. And no one spoke a word to him. For they saw that his suffering was very great. There is something powerful in this, isn't there? A writer named Joseph Bailey wrote a book called The View from a Hearse after he and his wife suffered the tragedy of seeing their three sons killed in an accident. Listen to what he says, quote, I was sitting torn by grief. Someone came and talked to me of God's dealings, of why it happened, of, of hope beyond the grave. He talked constantly. He said things that I knew were true. I wished he would go away. And he finally did. Another came and sat beside me. He didn't talk. He didn't ask leading questions. He just sat beside me for an hour or more. He listened when I said something. He answered briefly. He prayed simply. And he left. And I hated to see him go. See, here's the heart of good friendship. When you're not in the middle of it, if life is going swimmingly, suffering is... Much more of an intellectual puzzle. Why does God allow suffering in the world? It's a bit academic. But the experience of suffering is not an intellectual puzzle. It's a journey, a painful, painful journey. The challenge of how to get over this mountain off, through this miserable storm. And what you need mostly is not information, but strength. And one of the sources of strength is a good friend, someone alongside you in it and with you through it. Not just on day one or two. That's pretty easy but for the duration. Because think about what must have happened for Job's friends to be there. They must have heard about the calamities that rained upon Job. They must have taken sufficient notice to allow it to become a thing that they would respond to and do something about. They must have organized their affairs with their families and, and their jobs to take time off. They, they get to Job and are with him weeks, perhaps months. That's pretty impressive friendship. We'll come back to what it might be for us to be that kind of community uh, in a moment. But before we get there, notice what friends shouldn't do. Point two. For some reason, the friends open their mouths and that's when the problems begin. Each in turn. First Eliphaz, then Bildad, and finally Zophar have their say. Each time they say something, Job replies. And they each make Three speeches to Job. So what you have is Eliphaz, Job, Bildad, Job, Zophar, Job. And then the same again. 
and then the same again, although the third cycle it's cut short. And if you select out just the three speeches by Eliphaz or just the three speeches by Bildad, it turns out that they basically make the same point from slightly different angles. And, and if you compare those three basic points that the three friends make, you can see that they are all just variations on the same overarching theme, namely what we have called moralism. Now, you remember how the book of Job sets up moralism. Moralism is the idea that you can read wisdom backwards and negatively. The wisdom of the Proverbs is right. Basically, in this world, what's right is what works, and what works is what's right. But what the Friends' speeches show is this, that you can't just simplistically see the negative of that, so that when things are going badly for someone, you read it backwards and conclude, therefore they must be doing something wrong. Which is precisely what the three friends say. And the point of having the three friends each explore three variations on that theme, three times each over two dozen painstaking and pain-dealing chapters is this. They absolutely exhaust every possible way you can run that argument. They give moralism a go from every possible direction. And in doing so, they show that it is utterly and entirely bankrupt. So, for example, you see it from the start in Eliphaz's speech, chapter 4, verse 7. Think now. Who that was innocent ever perished? Or where were the upright cut off? As I have seen those who plough iniquity and sow trouble reap the same. By the breath of God they perish, and by the blast of his anger they are consumed. So Eliphaz's point is pretty simple, his observation of the world, and, and this may lead you to think that he'd led a fairly sheltered existence, is that no one who was innocent ever perished, or the one who was upright was cut off. Which is the same thing as saying that when you get wheat growing in your field, it's not an accident, it doesn't just spring up from the ground by itself, you get wheat because you planted wheat. And if instead you planted barley, then guess what? You'll get barley. And what that means is that if you get trouble, it's because you planted trouble. If you get pain, it's because you ploughed sin. Comforting. Not. Actually, Eliphaz is a little more nuanced than it sounds. He, he agrees that Job is basically innocent. But, but he says, look, no one's perfect. So, so he shouldn't be too surprised that he endures a little bit of pain. And what Job should do is be patient. Just hang in there, stop blubbering, tough it out, seek God and commit his cause to him. And it will come good in the end. Well, if you think Eliphaz is the kind of friend you'd run a mile from when you're feeling down, then uh, don't get anywhere near Bildad. He's, he's hopeless. Bildad starts with the same moralistic, you get what you deserve and what you deserve is what you get premise. And he concludes that the fact that Job is alive now shows he can't have been too bad. Obviously, that's not the case with his kids. Listen to how he puts it in chapter 8, verse 3. Does God pervert justice? Or does the Almighty pervert the right? If your children sinned against him, he delivered them into the power of their transgression. And he goes on to say that the key thing Job should do is to search himself and heed the warning that he's been given in case he becomes as bad as his kids. There's nothing like a comforting friend and Bildad is nothing like a comforting friend. But it's, it's Zophar uh, who really shows us how not to be a friend. Chapter 11 uh, verse 1, then Zophar the Namathite answered, Should a multitude of words go unanswered, and should one full of talk be vindicated? Should your babble put others to silence, and when you mock, shall no one shame you? For you say, My conduct is pure, and I am clean in God's sight. But oh, that God would speak and open his lips to you, and that he would tell you the secrets of wisdom, for, for wisdom is many-sided. Know then, that God exacts of you less than your guilt deserves. In other words, you're suffering, Job, because you're a sinner, and since you won't admit your sin, you must be the worst of all things, that is, a secret sinner. And so you're getting less than you actually deserve, and you need to repent before it's too late. How's that for wise words of counsel? Stiff upper lip. Take the warning you're getting because of what's happening to the people around you. 
Repent because you're obviously sinning. These, these words might have been written 3,000 years ago, but what's so striking about them is how utterly contemporary their feel is. Don't, don't you recognize them? Haven't you heard someone say one or other of these things to you or worse? Haven't you found yourself saying or thinking some variation of these things to others? What's so terrifying about Job's friends is that as we read their speeches, we're not looking through a window into some, some distant place. We're looking straight into a mirror of our moralistic culture. We see ourselves in their speeches, both our society and even our own community as Christians. Suffering, career not going well, kids not turning out great, depression, Mustn't be faithful enough. Must be messed up somehow. Can't be trusting God enough. And it's dreadful. And yet, can I say, don't be too hasty to condemn the friends. They're not stupid. And in fact, they're onto something. Because if, if you throw out the wisdom principle completely... If you take its logical opposite, then what you're left with is just a kind of moral chaos and mere power, the rule of might. It's fair to say that nothing less than the moral fabric of the universe is at stake here. Listen to how Bildad puts it in chapter 18, verse 1. Then, then Bildad the Shuhite answered, How long will you hunt for words? Consider, and then we shall speak. Why are we counted as cattle? Why are we stupid in your sight? You who would tear yourself in your anger, shall the earth be forsaken because of you? Or the rock be removed out of its place? Surely the light of the wicked is put out and the flame of the fire does not shine. Do you see his point? If there is no wisdom principle at all, then the earth is utterly forsaken. The, the, the rock is removed. Nothing makes sense in its place at all anymore. No, the friends are not dumb, but they are incomplete. You see, it's not so much what they do say, as what they don't say that makes their words so dreadfully in error. And there are two crucial pieces missing from their framework. The first one is that they assume the only players in this world are God and human beings. And when that is the case, since God does no wrong, what it means is that the only wrong that exists is what is done by human beings, and hence suffering always follows from sin. But that is a shrunken view of reality. The problem with this is that there's no place for spiritual battle, for, for the existence of enemies, not of flesh and blood, but forces in the spiritual realms, and an evil one who's prowling around like a lion wanting to devour. And when you see that there is another player at work here in this world, it, it loosens up the system. Suddenly you can't run the cold, hard logic of moralism quite so tightly. But there's a second thing that they leave out as well, and that is waiting the friends assume that the link between what's right and what works is always now and near. It's immediate, which means that you can read off sin and suffering together in real time. But the scriptures say again and again that judgment is not now. It is at the end of the age, when righteousness will finally be at home instead of, as it is so often now, something of a stranger. And again, when you prize open the timescale so that what is ultimately true may not necessarily be immediately true, the logic of that negative moralism just won't work. And of course, it's in the cross of Christ that we see these two things most powerfully. There, the true and perfect Job became our perfect friend. He, he didn't apply to us the iron logic of moralism that we in fact deserve. Rather, he took it into himself. Ultimate sympathy, sympathos. Suffering with and even more suffering instead. And it's because we know that grace in Jesus that means that as we experience the sufferings of this world, we don't turn in on ourselves in accusation. We don't turn against God in accusation, but we wait with patience for God to finally overthrow all evil while saving us. And it's that waiting, that trust that can unleash a power so great that it can make our sufferings not destructive, but even transformative, honing us, polishing us, deepening us, conforming us to Christ. What the friends do wrong 
And what we must not do as friends is to try and explain suffering in terms of one form of moralism or another. Their attempts to explain Job's suffering turn out to be nothing other than an attempt to explain suffering away. And all that can ever do is weaken a person's soul, never strengthen it. Which is why at the end of the book, we hear God's verdict. Chapter 42, verse 7. After the Lord had spoken these words to Job, the Lord said to Eliphaz the Temanite, My wrath is kindled against you and against your two friends, for you have not spoken of me what is right, as my servant Job has. So, where we've come is to see what friends should do, which is to weep with those who weep and rejoice with those who rejoice, as the Apostle Paul puts it. And we've seen what friends shouldn't do, which is to explain a person's suffering, which inevitably means explain it away. But there's something that friends can't and mustn't do. And that is to take responsibility for the sufferer's soul. Strengthen, yes. But take responsibility, no. And one of the most interesting things about Job as he interacts with his friends is the way that he continues to take responsibility for himself in various ways. On the one hand, he is totally, even shockingly, emotionally honest. He doesn't pretend. He doesn't just shrug it off. He won't shove anything into a corner. He has a raw emotional realism that is quite confronting. Listen, for example, to the start of chapter 3. After this, Job opened his mouth and cursed the day of his birth. Job said, let the day perish in which I was born. And the night that said a man child is conceived. Let that day be darkness. May God above not seek it or light shine on it. Let gloom and deep darkness claim it. Let's clouds settle upon it. Let the blackness of the day terrify it. And as you read on, you see the same style again and again. Job won't pretend. He says it how it is. He's plunged into profound, dark despair and depression. He's in utter mental pain and anguish. That is a place where righteous believers go. That, that's not somehow forbidden territory to us. Don't for a moment think of anyone else or of yourself that what it means to be a Christian is that you'll always be H-A-P-P-Y. But at the same time, notice he won't go that last step. He won't give in to the suggestion that he must have done something wrong. And very importantly, he rejects what might seem an obvious option, namely suicide. He asks God to kill him, perhaps. But he realizes that he has not got the right to do that to himself. He goes all the way to the edge and stops there. There's, so there's an emotional honesty, an astonishing emotional intensity and honesty in Job. And at the same time, if I can put it like this, he, he does his emotions first and foremost to God. The one thing Job won't stop doing is praying. You, you see, for example, in Job 13, only grant two things to me, then I will not hide myself from your face. Withdraw your hand far from me and do not let dread of you terrify me. Then call and I will answer or let me speak and you reply to me. How many are my iniquities and my sins? Make me know my transgression and my sin. Why do you hide your face and count me as your enemy? And these two things are absolutely crucial to hold together. Either one without the other is a disaster. Emotional honesty without God will lead you only into despair. Because there can be no hope where there is not God. But going to God pretending, dishonestly, sanitizing your soul, not bearing it, is perhaps even worse. Because you'll blame God when you find no comfort because you've not brought your real self to him. And the reason that you can take the reality of the darkness of your pain to God is because he has been there before you. In Jesus Christ, we know one who had friends with him in the time of his greatest need and who failed him dreadfully, not even able to stay awake. He knew loneliness, not just from friends, but even from the father. He bore that which was not his to bear on a day of darkness, and he did it for us. And so when suffering strikes, we turn to him, not away from him. Now, there's something that even good friends can't do for us. 
which is to take responsibility for our own soul work before God, which is what we see Job doing again and again and again. Well, let's draw these threads together. There's, there's more to the how of handling suffering than we've seen here, and we'll come to some of those things over the next few weeks. But one of the crucial ingredients is being part of a community of care. And one of the really interesting things about the situation of lockdown that we find ourselves in is that we all both need that community of care, and at the same time, we're all aware of how others need that community of care. It seems to me that we have a perfect opportunity to be the friends that Job's friends weren't. To weep with those who are weeping instead of telling them to cheer up. And to rejoice with those who are rejoicing instead of telling them to calm down. And never, ever locking people into the misery and inadequacy of a cold, hard moralism. And it's as we know what a friend we have in Jesus the infinitely righteous person who endured infinite suffering for us, that we will find the spiritual resources both to open ourselves up to our friends, to be honest about our needs, and at the same time to offer true friendship, listening and loving and serving. Amen. Well, let's pray together. Our gracious God and loving Heavenly Father, we, we do look to you. Uh, we know that in the Lord Jesus Christ, there is no suffering or sadness or grief or depression that you do not know from the inside. And we praise you that you brought him through the other side of that, that he has gone before us. And so, Father, in whatever situation um, we find ourselves in or experiencing, we pray that you would so work in us by your Spirit, you'd fill us with your grace and love, that we would look to Jesus and endure. And we ask it in his name. Amen. gift of grace is Jesus my Redeemer there is no more for heaven now to give he is my joy my righteousness and freedom my steadfast love my deep and boundless peace to this I hold my Sure, the price 
it has been paid for Jesus bled and suffered for my pardon and he was raised to overthrow the grave to this I hope my sin has been defeated Jesus now and ever is my plea oh the chains are released I can sing I am free yet not I but through Christ in me I hold my shepherd will defend me through the deepest valley he will lead oh the night has been won how good is that news you might feel like you are in the deepest darkest valley right now and if you are it's worth remembering that Jesus is with you in it he has been there and he knows the way out Keep trusting him this week. We're going to continue our service in our congregational Zoom meetings momentarily. If you're new, you're welcome to join any of them, but you might particularly want to join the congregation of the friend who invited you, if you know which one that is. Otherwise, you can click on the I'm You link and you'll join a Zoom meeting with one of our pastoral staff where you'll get to hear a bit more about us as a church and also share some of your story. We look forward to seeing you there shortly.